Hey, good evening. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the ACS San Francisco Bay monthly speaker event, uh, the fourth Tuesday of most months. I'm Susan Hopp, a board member, and I'm here with fellow board member Gail Koza. And for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, ACS began in 1967 and is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, and porpoises and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and grants toward marine research. And regarding our grants, uh, we're really excited about this because we are now accepting grant applications through a link on our website. So if you go to our website and under grants, uh, you will find it. And we so appreciate um, the donations in support of our mission. And uh, of course they support our expenses around these monthly talks as well as funding our grants. And so to all of our donors, a big thank you. Now we're recording this session as we always do. And we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A. And after the presentation, um, we will do our best uh, to get to all of them. So on to tonight's presentation. Um, we're venturing to Malaysia to learn about Indo-Pacific finless porpoises. And we have a very distinguished and dedicated scientist as our tour guide. Cytologist and conservationist, Dr. Louisa Panapalam is coming to us from her home base of Malaysia, where it's Wednesday morning. Uh, Louisa will discuss her work studying and advocating for the finless porpoises in um, Malaysia. But let me tell you a bit about her. Uh, Dr. Louisa Panapalam is a cetacean ecologist living her childhood dream. She began her education in marine science at the University of Hawaii in Hilo. And then she went on to pursue a PhD on a prestigious Commonwealth scholarship at the University of London Marine Biological Station in Millport, Scotland, where she researched small dolphins in the Sea of Oman and the Arabian Sea. And Louisa is a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Species Survival Commission's Cetacean Specialist Groups, and is currently a research associate of the Institute of Biodiversity and Environmental Conservation at the University Malaysia Sarawak. Her research work on cetaceans and dugongs has taken her to the Bering Sea across the North Pacific Ocean, the Red Sea, Arabian Sea, South China Sea, Sulu Sulawesi Sea, and the Gulf of Thailand. Nonetheless, her true passion lies in increasing the scientific knowledge of marine mammals in her native Malaysia and to advocate for a greater awareness on marine mammal conservation among the Malaysian public. And it was this passion that led her to co-founding Mariset in 2012. In 2014, Louisa became the first Malaysian to be awarded with the prestigious Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation by the Pew Charitable Trust in the USA. And the Malaysian gov government honored her with the 2014 National Premier Youth Award. Uh, in 2018, she was a finalist at the Women of the Future Awards Southeast Asia. And with a dedicated team working alongside her, Louisa established the Long Kawi Dolphin Research Project, Matong Dolphin Research Project, Dugong Research and Conservation Project, and Sea Science and Schools Program that Mariset runs. Um, recently, Louisa was one of 100 women cetologists featured in the ACS's uh, Whale Watcher, uh, which is the publication from ACS, and it was a special edition uh, published just last year in 2020. So um, you can see we'll be expanding our ocean, our cetacean knowledge greatly with this um, talk. And 
Louisa, thank you again for being with us. So I'm going to turn it over to you. So good, good evening, uh, San Francisco, or good whatever, wherever you are. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Susan, um, for that uh, long introduction. But thank you so much. Um, and, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, a shout out to, I think, my friend Andrea, who is also on this webinar. Um, it was her who reached out to me uh, initially about doing the talk. So thank you. And um, I see some friends in the participants list. So um, hello, hello to those whom I know and who know me. Um, I, I will talk today about a, a species that is, uh, I would say, not everybody's cup of tea, not everybody's favorite. You know, most people who are interested in cetaceans, when you ask them, uh, what is your favorite species? You'll get uh, responses such as um, narwhals, orcas, blue whales, humpback whales. Uh, I've rarely come across anyone who actually said that um, their favorite species is a porpoise, um, especially a finless porpoise. But today I will talk to you a little bit about uh, one of my favorite species, the finless porpoise, a species that I have uh, grown to love um, um, and that I think needs uh, more attention. The world needs to notice it more than it currently is. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, also just, just, yeah. So I think that was a long introduction by Susan, so I won't, I won't elaborate more, but I'm here in Malaysia. I run a nonprofit and most of the information in my presentation today um, comes from the work that we've been doing on this species uh, since 2010. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so share screen. Share screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen? It looks go. good. All right. Okay, so um, I'll just I'll just begin. Um, so thank you again so much for having me here today. This is actually a brand new presentation that I, I put together. I've never actually uh, spoken solely just about finless porpoises, but I decided that, hey, it'd be nice to uh, do something different this time around. Um, so I, my talk is called Caring for the Uncharismatic, Shining the Spotlight on Indo-Pacific Finless Porpoises with some lessons learned from Malaysia, where I'm from. So just a very quick disclaimer, this presentation um, may contain, contain some images that may, may be upsetting for, for some people. So just to give you a heads up. <clears throat> so um, you can see on the map, uh, in red, I'm in Malaysia. So I am literally across the other side of the world from, from uh, San Francisco, denoted by the gray star on the map. Uh, Malaysia actually is a country, uh, we sit right on the equator in the heart of Southeast Asia, and uh, we are divided into two parts. The country is divided into two parts. One is Peninsula Malaysia, where I'm from. I'm based in the capital city of Kuala Lumpur, uh, right about, around, about here. Uh, and uh, there's also Malaysian Borneo, or East Malaysia as we call it. Um, you will notice the two boxes, two little square boxes uh, to the left of the map. So those are two of the uh, project sites where we've been researching cetaceans, uh, mainly small coastal cetaceans uh, over the last decade. And you'll hear a little bit more about these two places um, in my presentation. So that's where I'm from. And um, so we're a small country uh, and Essentially, uh, we've, we've made progress in cetacean research and conservation work in, in the last decade, but I think that we remain um, quite infant and quite far behind in you know, the things that we need to do. So um, we will keep working to improve our knowledge base of these uh, species over here in Malaysia. So, okay, finless porpoises, neophacina. So finless porpoises are a group of porpoises belonging to the family Fascinidae. And there are currently two recognized species, which are the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise, Neophacina fossinoides. And that's the species that I work on here. 
And there's also Neophacina asia orientalis, the narrow-ridged finless porpoise. And within the narrow-ridged finless porpoise group, there is also the Yangtze finless porpoise, uh, NA asia orientalis, and the East Asian finless porpoise, or the Sunameri porpoise, NA sunameri. And the Yangtze finless porpoise uh, lives as its name suggests, in the Yangtze River and the Oxbow Lakes that are, uh, you know, within that Yangtze River uh, system in China. Uh, and I think it's currently the only um, freshwater group of finless porpoises that, that we know. So in 2011, um, some scientists finally revised the taxonomy of finless porpoises under the genus Neophacina and um, concluded that there's actually two species of these porpoises. So previously, I think they were all just called Neophacina fossinoides. But over time, um, and you know, th looking through old literature and doing genetic research, morphological research, um, they found that there's actually two species. So as I mentioned, the narrow ridge um, on the IUCN red list, they're classified as endangered. And the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise, um, that are classified as vulnerable. However, in Malaysia, uh, as all marine mammals are protected by law, uh, Indo-Pacific finless porpoises are listed as a marine endangered species in my country. So, um, <clears throat> a little bit about what they look like. Uh, Indo-Pacific finless porpoises uh, is the one uh, on the top, on the top uh, left, you can see here, and the Asia Orientalis, the narrow ridge is the one on the bottom bottom here. So just to show you some differences, you can see that uh, Indo-Pacific uh, finless porpoises here in the yellow framed uh, photographs, they have this wide tubercule ridge on their back. So of course, finless porpoises, as their name suggests, are called finless because they don't have a dorsal fin. Um, all other species of uh, porpoises, um, that are known to science have dorsal fins, except for finless porpoises. But with the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise, they have this wide tubercule ridge over here. Uh, you can see here it's wide and there's these like nodules, which some scientists think could act as a sensory organ because these nodules are actually um, fitted with many nerve endings. So no one's really uh, sure the function, but that's the hypothesis. And then here you've, we've got um, the Sunameri subspecies the, um, of the narrow ridge finless porpoise. Uh, and you can see that they are much more pale in color compared to the uh, just the regular narrow ridge, the Asia orientalis, uh, and as well as the uh, finless porpoise, the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise. So they're much more pale, they're a light gray. Um, this, uh, this one's uh, taken in uh, Japan. And you can see here again, they've got this tubercled ridge, but the ridge is very much narrow and not broad like that of the Indo-Pacific uh, finless porpoise. So distribution wise, um, the narrow ridge finless porpoise is distributed from uh, uh, the Taiwan Strait uh, and they start from China, I think from the map it says Shanto, all the way up through to the Yangtze River, uh, up to the Korean Peninsula, as well as the southern half of Japan. Uh, in some places, such as in Taiwan, um, both the narrow ridge and the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise overlap in distribution. However, um, north of that, you uh, mainly get just the narrow ridge finless porpoise and with the Sunameri subspecies being found around the Korean Peninsula uh, and the southern part of Japan and I think the northern parts of China as well. And for the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise which I work on, um, you can see that they have a much wider range going from the Persian Gulf um, or Arabian Gulf, as you like to call it, or uh, and then all the way east uh, up to Taiwan and uh, certainly through South Asia and, and Southeast Asia as well. So again, um, we're over here in Malaysia where we study the, this, this species. So this is of course not a finless porpoise. Uh, it's also another one of my favorite species. It's actually a uh, Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin calf leaping out of the water. 
So I put this picture here because I just wanted to say that we're very used to dolphins and even whales leaping, breaching, and doing all sorts of ac acrobatic things um, out at sea. You know, when people go on dolphin watching trips or whale watching trips, everyone is enthralled by uh, uh, animals or an animal that is jumping out of the water and doing back leaps, back splashes, tail splashes. Um, <clears throat> however, and so, and because of that, these species are very charismatic. People generally love dolphins, they love whales, because they have so much charisma. They appeal to our human vision, you know, we like what we see, we are excited by them. However, it's not such the case with finless porpoises, which is why um, they are considered one of the less charismatic species of marine mammals. But first, I want to bring you a little bit closer to home, to San Francisco Bay. Um, you, you would recognize the landscape in the background. Uh, can you spot the harbor porpoise in this photograph? This, this was my best attempt to photograph a very elusive group of harbor porpoises. So go right there. So I would say that finless porpoises are sort of like harbor porpoises in that they are not easy to see, uh, especially if the sea is rough, a little bit rough or windy. Um, they, you know, they surface really quickly, blink your eye and they're gone. The only difference is that the harbor porpoise has a dorsal fin, um, whereas the finless porpoise doesn't. So maybe it's a little bit easier to spot them if they're surfacing. Um, but even then, I, I, you know, I've seen them uh, several times uh, out, out in the San, San Francisco Bay Area. And I must say that they're, they're also quite uh, elusive, but they have a fin. So at least that, that makes it a little better. Whereas the finless porpoise, look at it. I mean, just look at it. This is what we usually see uh, when we're out at sea. I can tell you that when our team are doing surveys, so many times, you know, we see something popping up in the distance. And then we're like, is, is it a floating coconut? Is it a porpoise? And we almost have to fix our eyes on that location to see if, you know, that, that, that bobbing thing would have moved a little bit or it keeps bobbing up in the same place. So usually if it's bobbing up and down in the same place, um, it's, you know, something that's just in the water, a debris, coconut, rubber tire. Um, and, if it, and of course, if they don't pop up again, then we're like, oh, was that a finless porpoise? You know, it's, it can be really frustrating uh, studying them uh, in the wild because sometimes after a long day and you've been staring at the water for days on, you know, days and days and hours and hours, and then you're like, did I see something? And then you wait and then it might pop up again or it might not. And then you go, okay, was that a sighting or was that not a sighting? Do we count it? Do we not? Yeah, so... But this is it. This this is this is ninety nine percent of the time a finless porpoise, right? Um, and so again, that's why they they really uncharismatic in that sense. But I've been very fortunate. We've been studying them uh, over a decade now, and you know we've we've been very fortunate to get to know the species a bit better. And I would say that if we give it a little bit more time to observe them, actually they're quite interesting in the way they in the way they behave. So I'll just give you a quick video, an uh, introductory video of uh, finless porpoises uh, on a good day. So this is a good day to see finless porpoise. And I'll just play that video right now. You can see that they were surfacing high enough out of the water that uh, we could see them. I'll just play that again. Don't blink your eye because they'll be gone in a jiffy. And so that's it, that, that's, that's a finless porpoise. It's not gonna breach for you. It's not gonna leap for you. Um, we're lucky if we get to you know, take a video like this. And I've been working on them for over a decade. And this video, particular, this particular video was actually shot last year, 2020. Um, you know, it's really very rare to get a good sighting where they hang around long enough for us to you know, whip out the video uh, whip up the camera and get a decent shot of them. Anyway, moving along, uh, let's just go back a little bit into time. Uh, so finless porpoises have actually already been mentioned or described, you know, in various um, old literature since the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example of one of this. This is the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London from 1900. 
right? So that's that's how many years ago. Let me just do the math really quick. That's 121 years ago, right? This paper was published. And you can see here, they, they describe the, what, what they call the little Indian porpoise as being the Fasina Fasinoides. So the scientific name uh, was also different at the time, but you can see it's uh, uh, the semblance of those names to today's current day scientific name. And, and under it, they also describe the larger Indian porpoise, which is what we know today as the Irrawaddy dolphin or Kyla brevirostris. Now, I was very excited to, to learn of this particular paper because you can see in the box in blue that I've, I've sort of outlined, it says in the museum at Taiping, there is a stuffed specimen caught of Matang in Para. Now, my team and I, we got really excited about this because Matang is our actual field site. It's one of the field sites where we're studying small coastal cetaceans, including the finless porpoises. So 121 years ago, uh, someone had already written about this species and, 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 and indicated a record of it, you know, from being caught, you know, from our field site 121 years ago. And that really got us really, really excited. Um, so they've been they've been around, you know, they've been sort of known to to literature and to science for quite a while now, um, but just, you know, maybe didn't gain that kind of attention as many other cetacean species um, did. And then you can see that I underlined here the larger Indian porpoise. So, um, and I'll explain why. I think, you know, based on what I know, I think why back in the day, one was called the little Indian porpoise and one was called the larger Indian porpoise. One was the word Indian was used is because to denote its distribution um, in the Indian Ocean. And then of course, the little and the larger because of the size. So here, here I've put together two photographs, one of the Irrawaddy dolphin, which is also a species we study, uh, and then the finless porpoise. So you can see how that they have certain similarities. The Irrawaddy dolphin and finless porpoise both have a rounded head. They lack that beak or rostrum that uh, dolphins typically have. So of course, the difference is that Irrawaddy dolphins are larger than finless porpoises and they have a dorsal fin. However, sometimes to the untrained eye and if, you know, if the sighting goes in a flash, uh, it might be dif difficult for a person to distinguish between the two. So when, you know, when I thought about it, I thought, okay, it makes sense why in the uh, publication in 1900, uh, why they might have called one the larger Indian porpoise and the other one the, the little Indian porpoise, because I think they thought that they looked quite similar and that, you know, the main differences were perhaps in, in size. So I put here the, the skull of the, the, uh, the two species here that, that we have in our um, repository here. And just to show you that again, if you were to pick up one or the other, you know, let's say you are strolling on a beach and you found either either skull, I think if you weren't trained or if you didn't know the difference, you might think that they they are quite similar. They both have a short rostrum, um, and you know they they sort of rounded in in shape. You know, dolphin skulls usually have, are quite elongated because of that rostrum, and that's not the case with these two. Mm -hmm. But I point out to you some of the uh, main differences. Of course, you can see here that they look actually quite different, but that also finless porpoise uh, skulls have these two holes uh, called the foramen or the occipital vacuity. Uh, I couldn't find any information on the function of these holes, um, you know, the anatomical function of these holes, but certainly um, the easiest way, I think, to know immediately if it's a finless porpoise skull is look at the back of the skull and look for these two holes. And, and then, you know, definitely finless porpoise. And then also they have this bony part that sticks out here near the nares, which is where it connects out to the, to the blowhole. Um, whereas in, in a dolphin, generally you can see it's flat. It, there, there's not, not that bony um, protruding bit on the skull. Okay. So that's one mistake, uh, case of mistaken identity sometimes, um, and in, perhaps in the past. And then also sometimes they've been mistaken to be dugongs. So in Malaysia, people, dugongs are also quite rare. It's not easy to see a live dugong, but somehow people are more aware about dugongs than they are finless porpoises. So on the left here is a newspaper article that I cut out uh, from 20, 2009. 
um, from a place called Penang Island, about a uh, three hours drive north of me. And um, the article says, a dugong carcass was found on Gurney Drive Beach. So when I first came across this article, I took a better look at it because first of all, I knew dugongs, um, there were, you know, I had never heard of records of dugongs uh, in Penang. Uh, and, and secondly, I took a look at the photo closely and I thought, hmm, it's kind of small and I, you know, it looks like a finless porpoise, definitely not a dugong, but somehow media uh, identified it wrongly. And again, you can see, I put the photograph here uh, orientated the same way. You can see how to an untrained eye, um, they might look the same. Um, dugongs also have a round, rounded head. They don't have this rostrum or a beak like dolphins do. Um, and then of course, upside down like this, you know, looks very, very similar. So my point here is that again, Finless porpoises are just, just not enough people know about them. And of course, lots of people know about dugongs. So immediately, if they see something like that, it's like, oh, it's a dugong, without actually thinking, hey, it might be something completely different. So moving along, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how my um, uh, experience, encounters, and relationship with finless porpoises began. Uh, in 2010, my, my co-founder Fyrel and myself, we were fresh off our uh, degrees. We had just returned home to Malaysia after studying abroad for several years. And we were looking for a project site. And we were told that there were these pink dolphins in Langkawi. Langkawi is about a 45 minute flight from Kuala Lumpur, where I am, uh, or a seven, eight hour drive north and then taking a ferry across. So it's, um, it's the oldest landmass in Malaysia. Uh, there are more than 99 islands in this archipelago of dense tropical forest cover with a 550 million year old geology. It is uh, currently listed as a UNESCO global geopark, uh, has high biodiversity uh, and you know, a significant um, level of uh, endemism as well in terms of uh, species diversity. It's a beautiful place. And uh, we've been doing work there since 2010. Um, so this is a map of the uh, archipelago. So in 2010, we went there because we heard that there were these pink dolphins. Um, and, and so we were trying to choose a site, right? We were new kids on the block and um, trying to choose a site. And people said, try there. And then we thought, because Langkawi is one of our top tourism destinations in the country, we thought we should try to go to a place where there are cetaceans, but that, that, that could also be um, human activities, conflicts with human activities, so that we can try to establish you know, where the animals are and how they're using the habitat and how we could you know, use our science to inform conservation. You will notice here that, so we created, uh, so be, at that time in 2010, Mariset was um, not in existence yet. We started off as a project. So you will notice here that uh, we included the Finless Porpoise um, in our logo. I tried to Google Finless Porpoise logo and I actually only came up, you know, the Google search results came up with just one other logo that featured a Finless Porpoise. And I think it was something to do with the Yangtze River Finless Porpoise. I, I could be wrong, but it appears that not many people have finless porpoises, um, you know, on, on their logo or emblem for, you know, project or organization. So anyway, we paid homage to the two species that we work with, uh, which is the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin, as well as the Indo-Pacific uh, finless porpoise. Just to show you very quickly, so over the last 10, uh, 11 years now that we've been studying um, these cetaceans in Langkawi. This is you know, a map of where um, animals are distributed. You can see on the western coast of Langkawi Island, you will see a blue star. That star denotes the, the location of the very first uh, finless porpoise I'd ever seen in my whole life. So as I mentioned, we went to Langkawi looking for these pink dolphins that we were told about. And of course, we went, uh, it was October 2010, our first very first survey, we were excited, but we didn't know what to expect, what would we actually find. There wasn't much in the literature to sort of point us in the direction of what we would really find. 
And of course, the first thing that we recited was a finless porpoise. I will never forget it popped up, you know, just ahead of our bow. Like it just popped up once and it wasn't seen again. Like if you blinked your eye, you would have missed it. But even though that encounter was so short, that first encounter with this species is you know, forever etched in my mind. Um, anyway, so for the rest of the October survey, all we saw were finless porpoises. And at the time, of course, we were quite disappointed. So I, like many people, you know, was like, finless porpoises, they're so mm, boring. They're not doing anything. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to count them. It's hard to detect them. Every time the wind blows up, then, you know, we're going, is that a finless? Is that a wave? Is... So it was very frustrating. But over the years, I've come to learn that Langkawi, uh, at least within Southeast Asia, appears to be a really important place uh, for finless porpoises. And actually a place where if you wanted to go and see finless porpoises, Langkawi would be the place because they're everywhere. Um, of course, sometimes they're not around, but most of the time, year round, they are there. So, you, you know, um, this is where my relationship with this species, this uncharismatic species began. And, you know, over time, I've really taken a liking to them. I, you know, I really, I do call them my favorite species. I get weird looks from people when, when they say, not, not a blue whale or not a humpback whale. I think, no, I like, I like finless porpoises because I've had that opportunity to work with them and to observe some of the cool behaviors, uh, which of course uh, is, it's not caught on camera or video because everything happens so quickly all the time. But anyway, you can see that they're distributed quite ubiquitously throughout the uh, island archipelago across to the peninsula Malaysia mainland. And because we share the in our uh, international border, you know, with Thailand really close to this site, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that they range up into Thailand as well. And, you know, wild animals, you know, just like you have the gray whales over there, they have no passport. They can just move between borders as and when they wish. So here's a, a, another video, um, a drone video, uh, just to show you uh, what they look like from the air. Uh, I apologize, it's not the best drone video that, that we have. Um, I mean, it's not the best drone video, um, but it also go, comes back to the fact that they're not easy to track uh, with a drone. So you can see the drone is sort of shifting around. My student was trying to keep it in frame, but was finding it hard to locate where it is. And then with the glare, uh, it can be quite tricky. But what we found is that, you know, they like to just swim just under the surface of the water, and then they will surface just a little bit enough for you to see their back that looks like the floating coconut and, and then back down. Um, next is Matang. So remember I mentioned Matang just now, the, the place that was mentioned in the 1900 publication. So this is this is the site. This is about a three hour drive from Kuala Lumpur. It is an area um, uh, where the coastline is lined with mangrove trees, lots and lots of mangrove trees. And there are these um, riverine waterways that go inland. And um, our site is fed by five large estuaries. So it's, it's a really, it's a turbid water area with mud flat that ex extends out to two kilometers from shore. So I show you here a map uh, of the three species that we study in the area. And over here, so earlier, if you saw in Langkawi, the distribution of species seems to be quite mixed. Whereas here in Matang, it's very clear that finless porpoises occur um, well off the coast. So, you know, closest to the coast, to the estuaries, we have the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins or those pink dolphins that I keep mentioning. And then in that middle swath, we have Irrawaddy dolphins occupying that coastal area habitat. And then further offshore, once the water gets to be about anything from um, ten, seven to 10 meters onwards, um, the finless porpoises begin to appear in this area. So I, I put these two maps here just to, to drive from the point that uh, we've been studying them for long enough, but you know we can see that the way they use their habitat and the way they are distributed even along the same stretch of coast uh, can be quite different and that we really don't understand enough yet about um, how they're distributed and uh, you know where and why. 
but we're making progress. So between, between Langkawi and Matang is a 200 kilometer distance along the same coast. Yeah, and you can see how they are differently distributed. So again, um, for many years, we just didn't know what finless porpoises eat or even humpback dolphins for that matter in our site. But in, in a few recent years, we were able to, we encountered a few carcasses which we were able to recover and cut them open to get the stomach contents out. So I've always wondered, how do these two species in Langkawi live together? You can see from the map earlier that their habitats overlap quite significantly. And I think one of the drivers of how they are able to just coexist is, is the fact that they, they feed on different things in Langkawi. So you can see here on the left, um, I know it looks a bit gross, I'm sorry about that, but uh, stomach contents of a humpback dolphin um, that's actually a catfish. You can't really tell from the photograph, but that, that's a marine catfish. So we found mainly cat, uh, mainly fish remains in the stomach of uh, the humpback dolphins. And then in finless porpoises, uh, we found lots and lots and lots of cephalopod remains. Um, and these we know are, you know, ranging from octopus to squid to cuttlefish. So they eat all cephalopods. There were some fish remains in there, but mainly cephalopods. And so one of the things as well that we've learned, how can we detect them when we're uh, doing surveys to observe them? Sometimes actually what we've learned is that we see the squidding before we see the, the porpoises. So suddenly we'll be going along our transect line and then boom, the water turns black. Then we're like, oh, what happened? And then moments later, we'll see a few porpoises surfacing, you know, from the distance. So we know that probably what's happened is that they've been hunting um, for squid or octopus. We don't know the fate of the, the squid or octopus, but we know that they, they either got eaten and squirted out the ink or they fled and squirted out the ink. So one of the ways that we've learned is that look out for squid ink when, you know, trying to look for finless porpoise, especially if the water is clear enough, because uh, that's one way to to spot them before they actually surface. And when we found these um, cephalopod remains in the stomachs of the porpoises, uh, it confirmed, it further confirmed our hypothesis that they were feeding on um, squid and cuttlefish and octopus. Now, whereas in Matang, in our other site, um, this is one stomach content from a female finless porpoise that we, we had. Um, and what we found is she consumed a lot of prawns uh, she consumed a lot of prawns. You can see from the photograph when we took it out of the stomach, the prawns are still orange in color, um, you know, not digested. So she must have been feeding um, quite, uh, quite a lot um, prior to her death. Um, and uh, of course, she was also feeding on cephalopods and some fish. So we didn't see any prawns so far in any of the finless porpoise stomach contents that we have from Langkawi, but certainly in Matang, they are also feeding on prawns. And which makes sense because Matang is a place that is known for um, its abundance of and diversity of prawns, which are actually commercially important uh, species for our seafood industry here. So just moving along a little bit, um, let's talk a little bit about threats. You know, finless porpoises are threatened with basically the same things that most cetaceans all around the world are threatened with. Habitat degradation, coastal development, underwater sound pollution, um, you know, entanglement in fishing gear, uh, marine debris, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, here we um, using a technique that was um, developed by my colleague um, Ellen Hines and her colleagues, uh, the bycatch bi risk assessment. We did some of that using the data that we have to look at what were the most, um, what were the fishing gears that were of highest risk, uh, posed the highest threats or risk to finless porpoises in Langkawi. So based on the plot that you can see on the map here, um, you can see that nets ranked very high and then next was trawl trawlers. Um, the red areas denote areas of highest bycatch risk, basically where the overlap between fishing activities and um, animal distribution was the highest. Um, and of course, we also uh, looked a little bit at the overlaps between 
between uh, ferries and speedboats and where animals were distributed. So we could identify areas that would be of high risk for vessel collision and underwater sound pollution. And what we do with these things is to try and feed them into uh, conservation recommendations to the authorities um, to try and push for better habitat management and habitat protection. Uh, it's a long process. It's not an overnight process. It's not like I take this map to somebody and say, hey, you got to do something and tomorrow something happens. It takes a lot of negotiation. But the important thing is to have the data to, to back up our claims. Now, you'll see a, this photograph on the top right here, which is of a, a, a freshly dead um, finless porpoise that was found stranded on the beach, not in Langkawi, in a different site in Malaysia. But you can see that I put the photo here is because you can see the, the yellow arrows pointing to the net scars. So we know definitely this animal, you, you can see it looks pretty healthy, uh, it looks pretty young as well, but it had these net, net scars. And you can see that the net was entangled around its body and it probably died of um, asphyx asphyxiation from being unable to surface, to breathe, okay? Um, unfortunately, even though this bycatch risk map shows that nets are the highest threats to um, porpoises, finless porpoises in Langkawi, very often the carcasses that we encounter uh, are already in this kind of advanced state of decomposition. So when you have something that's in an advanced state of decomposition like this, it's very difficult to um, detect these net scars and any rope wounds and things like that because a lot of the epidermis would have peeled off. Um, and unfortunately for us here, we also lack the expertise in our marine wildlife vets. So very often, and some, you know, a lot of times we can't get to every um, stranding incident. Um, so we don't get to do like a proper necropsy or to look into why it died. Did it die from uh, what? You simply put drowning because they were entangled or something else, disease or, or old age. So it's very hard to know um, what, what caused these animals to die. But certainly, I think having a bycatch risk map helps with precautionary measures on what we need to do for conservation. This is in Matang, um, the other site. So here, the bycatch risk assessment that we did for, for this species found that trawl nets were the ones posing the highest um, risk to finless porpoises in Matang. So if you recall the slide earlier, I showed you that the finless porpoise was eating prawns. So that particular animal, um, she was actually a pregnant female, very sad. Uh, and she was caught, she died from having been caught in a trawl net. And over here um, is another photograph of uh, a carcass that we found floating at sea while we were on survey. And we suspect that, again, it was a victim of being caught in a trawl net um, and you know, having died from asphyxiation or drowning in the trawl net because you can see these scratch marks, uh, which are reminiscent of an animal probably having been squished up against a trawl net for many hours as the net dragged along. Um, underwater and you know the, the the net these trawl nets are made usually from nylon they're hard plastic so we think that these uh, scratches were from probably a, a trawl net um, and when they reel you know when the fishermen reeled up these nets uh, found the porpoise and then they just discarded it at sea before leaving it and that's how we were uh, probably able to you know come across it floating on the water still relatively fresh as well so anyway, talking about threats, you know, like I said, there's all sorts of threats, uh, fisheries entanglement, um, bycatch is an issue. But if you ask me what would be one of the biggest threats uh, facing this species, I would personally say it's oblivion. Just the fact that they just, not everyone's favorite, not everyone's cup of tea, uh, they're not charismatic. No one's gonna go out on a limb saying, hey, we gotta save finless porpoises today. I think that's, What's worrying? I must say that there has been uh, increased interest lately, uh, even uh, within the scientific community, for the, the plight and welfare of finless porpoises um, all around. But I think that we need to do a lot more to raise the profile of this small cetacean, which seems to be quite ubiquitous uh, where they occur. Um, but that just no one, no one, you know, launches a campaign to save finless porpoises. 
purposes, especially, you know, here, uh, Indo-Pacific finless purposes in particular, um, it's really like almost out of sight, out of mind. A lot of people try to shy away from studying them because they're just not that exciting or easy to observe. So oblivion, our oblivion is a big risk, a big threat, I think, to the survival of this species. But we're getting better, but we need to do more. So again, um, again, I, I, you know, I put the disclaimer in the beginning, uh, some of these images might be upsetting, but just to show you that, you know, phyllis purposes are more at risk than we realize or care to notice. Uh, these photographs here represent only 30% of the total number of cases that I have on record of dead uh, finless porpoises from Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, you can see the photograph on the top uh, left here with the red arrow. That's actually pointing to a calf that's sort of halfway being born or I don't know what the circumstances of um, the death of this particular animal was. It was just a photograph I saw on the internet, um, but from Langkawi, where someone had come across this floating female porpoise and um, she had her calf halfway coming out and they were both dead. So that was very sad. But the, the point is that when a whale strands or and to some extent when a dolphin dugong strands, these cases sometimes uh, appear in media, in the newspapers and online news, sometimes for days. There's so much interest in these kinds of strandings. But very often, when a finless pauper strands, either it's just left there to dry up and no one even noticed that it was something, um, or it, it, just, it just doesn't get the coverage that it should. Or, or if it did make it into newspaper, like you saw in the earlier slide, it's called a dugong. So I really think that they're a lot more at risk than we realize and care to notice. It's just simply because of the way they look and the way they are. But I think it's time that we started taking more attention because they are at risk. I mean, and you know, this next slide here, I, I just, you know, very simply put on a, you know, a chart here, the number of cases that I have in my files of finless porpoise um, strandings and carcasses in my files, just from Peninsula Malaysia alone. And you can see that finless porpoises top the charts, so to speak, um, with about 55 cases that I have on record. Uh, humpback dolphins were about 30 records that I have, and Irrawaddy dolphins about 16. When this data is from 20, 2009, all the way to 2021 present day. And I can tell you that this is just a fraction, you know, probably a fraction of what's actually the real number of strandings and dead animals that, that are out there. Because these are only the ones that we know of, either because we did some internet mining and found records on social media um, or, or media, uh, or we were informed by the public about these incidents, uh, some of which we are able to attend to, some which we're not, or because we came across these incidents during our surveys. So it's really only those that we know of, and it's not exhaustive. I do believe that there's probably a lot more cases out there um, where either nobody found the carcass, um, nobody came across it, it didn't strand on the beach, or if it did, uh, nobody paid much attention to think, hey, this is something that should be reported or talked about. But it's worrying anyhow. So again, just to drive on the point that they are a lot more at risk than we notice or maybe care to care to realize. Just switching geography a little bit, um, I've done a little bit of work uh, in Vietnam um, with my colleague here, Mr. Wu Long. And um, you know, when we are there, we visit whale temples when we can. Uh, just, just a point to make here that what I've noticed, you know, in my times being in Vietnam, is that, and when we've been to whale temples, that there is a lot of finless porpoise uh, skeleton and skulls in these whale temples. So in Vietnam. Uh, if you're doing an at sea survey for cetaceans, it's really hard to see many cetaceans at all. Um, however, when you go to the whale temples, 
there's just loads of finless porpoise remains in these whale temples. So what are whale temples? Sorry, uh, whale temples are these temples, uh, you know, places of worship where uh, all along the Vietnamese coast line, there are these whale temples. There's a local culture of belief, especially amongst the coastal communities and fishermen, um, where any marine mammal that strands on the beach, um, you know, um, is an omen. And, and they believe that in worshiping, um, you know, cetaceans, it's, it's, it's help give the, it helps give the fishermen protection when they go out to sea, protection from um, bad weather, you know, and good luck for a bountiful harvest, etc. So all along the coast, there are these whale temples that have been um, erected, you know, in villages uh, along most of the coastline. So whales, dolphins, anything that strands, they will um, put it up and offered at the, these altars eventually. You can see here in the photograph, whale bones in the two side columns. So anyway, back to, to my time in Vietnam doing some work there on cetaceans with my colleague. What we found is that even though we don't see finless porpoises when we're doing at sea surveys, there just seems to be many, many finless porpoises in these whale temples, which means that over the years, many finless porpoises have washed ashore dead or alive, we don't know, but many finless porpoises have washed ashore and, you know, they're then buried and then later up, later on exhumed and then placed in these temples to be worshipped. So again, I just wanted to drive home the point about the fact that they're out there, there's finless porpoises out there and, you know, somehow they, I think there's a lot more that are dying from various factors, again, it could be from entanglement or other things, but we're not quite noticing perhaps how severe the, the problem could be. Um, so anyway, um, whale temples are a totally separate topic altogether. I don't want to go too much into, into them. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting topic actually of cultural and conservation perspective. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's, that was my experience with, with, with this in Vietnam. So coming back to Malaysia, what have we done with all this information that we have through the years? We have managed to use the data to nominate um, our field sites to become IUCN Important Marine Mammal Areas, IMAs. And in 2019, we got two of our cetacean sites formally designated as IMAs, with noting that the one, the one for Langkawi, the Langkawi Archipelago IMA, was largely based upon the fact that Langkawi is an important habitat for finless porpoises um, and of course humpback dolphins as well. So now we're trying to use this as a basis to push for the better protection of these habitats in these two areas, uh, you know, better management um, and, and to consider protected areas for these um, vulnerable and endangered species. So talking about Emma's, I just wanted to play you uh, one last video that I have in this presentation, Oops. which just, uh, which is again from Langkawi. Um, you can soon see the finless porpoises, they're popping up everywhere. So again, this was another day that we were able to, you know, um, get a decent video of finless porpoises. Um, you can see there's quite a few of them. And again, it's it's really a reminder that a place like Langkawi is really important for finless porpoises. They may not be the most charismatic or charismatic at all, um, but they're there. Uh, this is their home. This is all you'll get. Again, they're not going to leap or breach for you. Uh, but that it doesn't mean that they don't deserve any more attention than any other more charismatic cetacean species that we have. And so again, just to you know reiterate you know, uh, we pay homage as well to this rather uncharismatic species in our project logo, you know, having a finless porpoise on it. Other ways that we try to do, uh, other ways that we try to raise the profile of this species here locally is, you know, we make as an NGO, we have uh, merchandise and, <clears throat> and one of the things that we made recently was stickers. So at first, <clears throat> these stickers that we made, uh, encompassed uh, humpback dolphins, Irrawaddy dolphins, dugongs, and brooders whales. So actually, finless porpoises is the last uh, in the series to make its appearance. Uh, but I decided that, hey, I don't know if people will want to buy stickers of finless porpoises, for example, 
but I think we should have them anyway because uh, I think we should sort of get people talking and 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 you know we don't want fitness purposes to be out of sight and out of mind. We want them to be in people's minds. So these stickers were designed um, by one of our team members. Um, based really on some of the observations of finless porpoises that we've observed of their behavior, of their swimming style, of their surfacing. And uh, we decided to put them onto these stickers uh, that, you know, people can stick on their car, on their tumblers, you know, and carry finless porpoises with them anywhere and start a conversation. Because when was the last time you saw stickers with finless porpoises on them? I I've never seen personally, so I think these are quite special. So that's one way we're trying to raise the profile. We also have a series of infographics that we do that we put up for social media. And um, you know, we are sure not to forget or leave out finless purposes in our uh, infographics. So for example, here you've got one that is dedicated just to the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise with a local context of you know, where they are mostly seen. And then one you know, that tells people what is the difference between porpoises in general um, and dolphin you know, in terms of their teeth. So earlier this year uh, in February, we got news that Langkawi, there's a proposed mega development plan um, in Langkawi that will involve the reclamation of about uh, 1,900 acres of sea area. Right. And of course, we wouldn't, you know, I don't know what's the latest status of this project now. It still, I think, needs all the approvals and whatnot. But we wrote into every media channel that we could and we managed to get, you know, this letter of concern published online to indicate that we were really concerned about this project that would reclaim so much sea area. And in the article, in this letter, one of the things that we specifically mentioned, and you can see here in the pink color box, is that we have documented numerous sightings of finless porpoises in the vicinity of the development site. So again, we wanted to give that spotlight to finless porpoises because truly where they want to build this ridiculous development is where we see mainly finless porpoises as opposed to the humpback dolphins. So once again, we wanted to put that forth that, hey, you're encroaching into finless porpoise habitat and you really shouldn't. And um, we're going to try and keep the pressure on. Um, we don't know what's the status. There's not much transparency, but at least we put out there that, hey, this is what's happening and you shouldn't be doing it. And then finally, just in general, as, an, as a conservation organization here in Malaysia, you know, a lot of our science is translated into uh, marine education programs where we want to bring the marine mammals and the sea to kids into their classroom or into makeshift classrooms outdoors. Um, so we have a thing called the Whales on the Wheels Marine um, Education Mobile Truck, uh, where hopefully next year, with if COVID is under control, we want to take this truck on a nationwide tour uh, and we'll be sure to include our finless porpoise skulls uh, in the truck as well so that we can uh, tell people about finless porpoises and all other species that we work with. Um, so think about it like a food truck, but just filled with marine mammal information. And then of course, we use a lot of the signs that we, we know to train up local community members from vet students to fishermen, tour operators, nature guides, um, uh, and we've used our signs for local policy and plans, action plans, recommendations, uh, you know, areas that need to be looked out for in terms of um, boat speeds, um, development, etc. So, and of course, you know, where there's information available on finless purposes, we are definitely sure to put that in as well. So I, I'm, I'm really at the end. I just want to end with, we have to figure out better ways to make other species more visible and make these emotional connections with people. How do we make people love a harlequin toad, red colobus monkey or a tamarong? Or in this case, finless porpoise, right? Um, it's a quote by um, a guy named Barney Long from Global Wildlife Conservation. And then uh, someone from ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, Olivia Couchman said, if you cannot tell an engaging story about these incredible animals and the threats they face, it is almost impossible to engage anyone. 
Each species on this planet tells us a story and we are their voices. So I hope you've enjoyed the talk. I hope I've been able to engage you uh, with Finless Porpoises. Uh, and I hope that I've been able to tell their story and be their voice today to at least uh, share with you a little bit about this you know, highly uncharismatic cetacean uh, that deserves a lot more attention. And before I go, I just want to quickly put in a plug that at Mariset now, uh, we have just curated a virtual dolphin tour, um, which, which, which can be participated by anybody around the world because it's a virtual tour. Um, and uh, so if you're interested, this, this is great for school groups, um, especially school and learning groups. So if you're interested, please get in touch with us to run this tour. We can send you more information. Um, and um, really that's it. That's all our social media channels and contact information. And I'm done. Louisa, thank you so much. Um, I think you've probably definitely turned some, some of us into big fans of uh, finless porpoises. So yeah, thank you. Yes, and we have a number of questions for you. So if you can stay on for a bit longer, we'd love to run through them. Sure. Um, one question. So we're very interested in hearing anything that you've learned about um, kind of signs of their social behavior and intelligence. It, um, what, what have you learned about these animals and their kind of how they interact with each other, their social structure and communications? So again, it's, um, it's not easy to know this information because I would say 80% of the time when we watch uh, observe them at sea, what you'll see is they'll just surface and then they're gone. Kind of like a harbor porpoise. And then you're left wondering, wait, was that or was that not? So it, it's very rare to get like a sighting where they're not trying to run away from the boat they're close enough for you to really know what's going on. And then because two things, one is because they hardly surface. And secondly, uh, where we work, the water is turbid. So underwater observations are quite impossible. It's, it's often very difficult to know what's going on. But what we know is that we've seen that they do aggregate in groups of up to about 40 animals sometimes, although most of the time they are in you know single animal, as you saw from the drone footage earlier, or in small groups. Um, I think recently in Hong Kong, there was um, a group of researchers there who found who managed to get a drone footage of these porpoises there. That and the the, the porpoises there were observed to catch fish by stunning the fish with their tails. So they were swimming around and they were sort of slapping slapping the fish with their tails. We haven't really seen that in our sites, um, but. You know, we've also learned how to recognize when they're feeding. One is by, you know, like I said, the squid ink and when they're not surfacing very often because that means that they are at the bottom digging around for octopus perhaps or for squid. Um, but also when they, so even though they only um, surface really little bit, little bit of their back showing, sometimes we see them roll on their side. You can see their tail sticking out and then they lunge forward. So we know that that's one of the ways as well where they're, um, um, feeding on whatever they're trying to catch. In terms of social structure, no information, but what we've also noticed a lot that we've seen, so, you know, they occupy the, like in Langkawi, they live sympatrically with uh, humpback dolphins, but it appears that they don't interact. There's, the two species don't really interact because mm -hmm. even though sometimes we've seen them appear together, both groups of animals are doing their own thing. Also, finless porpoises, you know, they, they don't whistle, they only click. And they click in the ultrasonic range, which means that it's beyond our, our hearing uh, frequency. Um, and I, I wonder if, you know, um, there's any kind of interaction acoustically between humpback dolphins, perhaps, and finless porpoises. But really, we know very little about them. And um, hopefully, moving forward, we can use drones to better monitor the species bearing in mind also that uh, it's not easy to track them because they're small and they move so quickly, but we're going to try. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I don't have more information because there really isn't much. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing what you do know. 
it's more than we knew about an hour ago. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> we have a, a couple of questions about mating. And so just based on what you just said, we may not know the answers to these questions, but um, one is a question about, uh, do we know the relative um, age of reproduction age of these porpoises and the rate of reproduction? Do we know anything about that? I think uh, from studies done in Japan, if I recall correctly, finless porpoises can reproduce every year. So porpoises, unlike dolphins, they re reproduce a lot quicker, but they also have a shorter life lifespan. Yeah. So I think finless porpoises maybe live like 10, 15 years. So I think quite early on, they are already reproductively mature. If I'm not mistaken, like, at two, three years of age, they reach sexual maturity. And then from there, at least from the data from Japan, um, they can reproduce uh, every year. Yeah. So, um, you know, for, for example, I think in the English Channel or in the North Sea, in the, around the UK, there's, you know, a, a few tens of thousands of um, harbor porpoises that have been estimated. Um, which sounds like a lot because, well, and, and I remember talking to a scientist there and he said it's not surprising because they do have a pretty high reproductive rate. But having said that, you know, because of the, the way they are and their small size, they are also very at risk from things like uh, fishing gear entanglement. So I think that maybe the saving grace for finless porpoises is that they reproduce pretty quickly. Uh, uh, so there's still a certain amount of pressure uh, in terms of fisheries entanglement that the species could endure. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, we shouldn't be concerned anyhow, of course. Right, absolutely. Um, and we also had a question about uh, if there's ever been any evidence of them um, creating a hybrid with humpback dolphins, but it sounds like what you were saying earlier is that it seems like they don't interact. So I'm guessing the answer to that question is no. Uh, no, not that we know of, not that I've seen any papers, but I think there was an incident in, I want to say somewhere in China, I think, where they documented um, humpback dolphins having adopted or abducted, not sure, a finless porpoise calf, a newborn finless porpoise calf. So no one really knows what happened there, but they had documented this, where adult, adult dolphins had, you know, were with this calf and there didn't seem to be, you know, other finless porpoises around. But certainly, in terms of hybridization, I don't think anyone. Know, know. I don't think so, and it's not been documented, at least in the literature. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <clears throat> um, on the topic of foraging, um, regarding fishing for prawn. Um, some effort has taken place to help vaquitas in Mexican waters by using adapted equipment with limited success. Are similar efforts taking place to limit finless porpoise drownings due to prawn fishing in Malaysia? So at the moment in Malaysia, um, trawlers trawling for prawns, some trawlers trawling for prawns have to be fitted with um, turtle excluder devices. Uh, because of an agreement that they have with the U.S. in terms of importing, exporting shrimp to, to the U.S. market. So some of these are fitted with the turtle excluder device. But in general, across most of Southeast Asia and certainly across Malaysia, currently there, are, there have not, not been any bycatch mitigation uh, measures, as we call it. So there have not been any programs that um, set up any kind of deterrent or looking at gear change to, to prevent um, or to reduce the number of bycatch. We hope that we can start that in the near future, but of course, you know, these things um, need a lot of funding, they need a lot of negotiation with the government, and of course they need a lot of negotiation with the fishermen as well, getting the fishermen to buy in, to agree that, you know, something could be placed on their net to be a deterrent, or that they should change their mesh size. Um, in our site in Matang, a few fishermen have indicated that they would be open to trialing out bycatch mitigation measures on their fishing gear if we could guarantee that it does not impact their catch yield. So, um, but no, the, the short answer is no, we, we haven't done any such thing in Malaysia. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, another question for you, um, just about kind of the frequency of the sightings. It, do you have a sense that you are seeing a lot of these porpoises because you're focusing on finding them and kind of making that effort? Um, or do you actually think that um, it's the distribution and the population is indeed greater than other species in the area? I think so having worked there since 2010, I, I did ask myself that question before as well. But we sometimes they are they are difficult to spot. And sometimes when you're actually on effort trying to look for them, they don't show up. But then sometimes a lot of times when you're just going from point A to point B to get somewhere to do something else, you know, you'd see them popping up even without any effort of us looking. So over the years, we've come to know that Langkawi especially is really an area that uh, has a lot of has a lot of finless porpoises. Um, it is somehow a significant habitat for the species, um, and it is basically the most commonly occurring species in the area. So it's 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 not just because we are looking for them or yeah it it they're just there. And um, I remember there was one trip I brought a colleague from Canada. To the field with me and we were looking for um, humpback dolphins and all we kept bumping into that one fine day were finless porpoises and he was like oh stop it already I'm looking for dolphins yeah so they're there they're common in in our site in Langkawi yeah well that's, that's a good thing um yep yep um, another question is about marine pr protected areas. Are there um, such areas where drift nets are not allowed? And what is the estimate of population of finless porpoises um, around Malaysia? We, so first of all, we have marine parks, which were mainly, um, marine parks were mainly gazetted for coral reef areas. And so, you know, if a cetacean habitat happens to fall within this marine park area, then great. But there's really been there's been no marine park that's been designated just for uh, marine mammals. So, um, because of that, we don't have data on you know whether how has a marine park or a protected area helped with um, a cetacean species um, population trend. Yeah. Uh, Largely across the region and in Malaysia, we don't have much population estimates of finless porpoises. Um, but in our site in Langkawi, we, assess, we have estimated between 900 to about 2,000 porpoises spread across the whole archipelago, which when you, you, when you sort of bring it down to, it sounds like a lot, but when you bring it down to density of animals per square kilometer, we actually have less than one individual per square kilometer. And for example, in our field site in Matang, uh, what we estimated was about 600 animals, bearing in mind that we don't think we got the full range of, in our survey site didn't extend further offshore, so we probably don't have the full range of where finless porpoises occur in Matang. But again, when we, when we calculate it down to density of animals, it's less than one animal per square kilometer. So, um, yeah, so it means that there's enough of them, but not enough of them. Yeah. Right. Um, Susan, do you have any questions on your end? I think we've worked through the Q&A at this point. Yeah, I, um, I was just curious a little bit more also about the, the trawling. Um, you know, given that that's probably the number one problem, you know, bycatch, and is that really is the is the target catch the shrimp, and also Louisa, um, I mean, are are they primarily um, in country shipping vessels, or you know, are they are they coming from other parts, you know, other countries? Yeah. Uh, okay. So trawling, it's a complicated question, but basically they, they are, I think in Malaysia nowadays, the trawlers just take everything and anything. I mean, you're just dragging along, right? So you just take everything in your path. 
And you know, back in the day, there's a, you know we call unwanted non-target catch species um, trash fish. They call it trash fish, right? But over here now, trash fish has found a market for itself in the form of animal feed and you know agricultural feed and things like that. So um, sorry about my my dogs. If you can hear them, um, so the, the the trawlers take everything um, and. Uh, there are even some trawlers that are illegally fitted with these extenders. So if they, even if they're supposed to be a bottom trawl or a mid-water trawl, they extend it so that the when you know when it's being trawled, that net opens up to the water surface. So basically, it just catches everything that it comes across. So um, there's, there's so much trawling that you know when we see them land these fish. Um, when we see them land this fish on the jetty, out of all that pile of stuff that they've gotten, right, including your boot or kitchen sink, um, there's really very few commercially important fish species or whatever in the net, you know? So it's really a concern because if they're already taking everything out of the sea, what is being left in there for marine organisms to feed on, never mind us and, and what we are, you know, people who like to eat seafood. So it's 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 pretty bad. Um, yeah, in terms of you know what are they catching? They're catching everything, not just shrimp. Yeah, and in terms of the in terms of the um, where the trawlers are, they're all locally registered trawlers, but more and more the the vessels are owned by Malaysian owners. However, the crew are foreign fishermen so um yeah i mean they're just working on the boats and they're just doing a job there's really no need to care so much about conservation right so yeah, yeah. yeah. we do have encroachment of foreign fishing vessels every so often but most of the trawlers that are mainly operating um are locally owned yeah well I, all i can say is Thank you for doing all the work that you do because um, you know it, it it's uh, it's difficult. So you got to really celebrate the wins and uh, and I know you do have a lot of those and all the work that you're doing. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean there's so much to do, right? Um, yeah. Sometimes I get really overwhelmed, but I think we just have to take it step by step and. And the good thing is we work with other more charismatic species that act as an umbrella species for the work that we want to do for finless purposes. So even if we don't particularly uh, put in a grant application, for example, just for finless purposes or whatever, the mere fact that we're working in the habitats of finless purposes on other species just means that we get to protect or we get to try and protect all these other species as well. And in and the finless poppers, yeah. Well, actually, one more question for you about education. I know you you do quite a bit of work with students and trying to introduce this species and other species to young people um, in Malaysia. Um, and I'm I'm curious whether you've noticed any sort of shift in how um, kids and their families think about and talk about um, these porpoises um, as a result of the, your efforts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we have had feedback from parents and kids who say, oh, thank you so much because I never knew about finless porpoises. I only knew about dolphins. And even with dolphins, I only just knew more usually uh, bottlenose dolphins, which are the ones that appear on TV, you know, that we usually see. So uh, definitely there's, people are um, intrigued, so to speak. People are intrigued and a lot of people tell us that they learn something new and that they didn't know we, we have these. And actually the issue that we face sometimes here in Malaysia is that a pretty lack of awareness. So, so many people have come up to us and say, are there really dolphins and whales in Malaysia? You, you know, I, I thought they were just only found in cold water or they're just migrating through from the Arctic or Antarctica. And I would have to tell them that no, Malaysia, we have um, year round resident porpoises and dolphins and dugongs and even whales. They're, they're, not, they're not lost, they're not strays from Antarctica. 
you know. Um, so I think it's it's like the bare basics. One of the things that we work on is just getting the bare basics for people to understand that um, any marine mammal in Malaysia is not imported, so to speak. They're locals. Yeah, and and because I, I think somehow because maybe of TV and you know a lot of what we watch comes from the West, like in Hollywood productions and things like that. So somehow a lot of us grew up with the mindset that dolphins are only found in cold water countries or cold water places. And again, because you know in the past, even when I was growing up as a kid, it was very hard to find information about local marine mammals because I mean basically the work just wasn't being done. So. Um, now through the work that we do here, definitely we've, um, we we get people who are like, oh wow, I didn't know that just over there, if I take a two hour drive and hit the coast, I'd be able to see dolphins. Yeah, so definitely positive, very positive responses from, from parents and kids. That's wonderful to hear. It's, it's so important to um, drive conservation locally and create that local connection. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, absolutely critical. So thank you for that work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, also doing this kind of work here in Malaysia, or I think in developing region, it's not very common, you know, a lot of people uh, would rather go into corporate sector. So it's just trying to tell people as well that, hey, you could make, you could make a job out of this. It's not easy, but it, you could, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one last check for any, any additional questions that anyone might have for Louisa. Oh, I think we are good. Louisa, thank you so much. And uh, I guess we're going to let you get on with uh, your Wednesday. Thank you so much. And, and, and you guys can get on with dinner, I suppose. It's well into dinner time. <laughs> thank you so much for thank you so much for tuning in um, and for listening to me and for the invitation. Really, I appreciate it. It was nice to chat with you guys too. And we'd love to have you back and uh, hope to see you um, in San Francisco. One of these I really miss yeah. California and San Francisco. So I really hope to come back soon <laughs> before long when everything's done. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Louisa. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone. Have a nice Bye. evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. We'll see everyone in, uh, in June. So thank you. And I'm turning off the recording. <laughs>